And that's all, so the OpenCV AI kit, the whole premise is it, it makes that easy to use and accessible, whereas this, you can only do neural inference. When you use this thing in the OpenCV AI kit, you get all those that cr the crazy powerful functionality and uh, kind of drag and drop flexibility mm -hmm. is what we've implemented. So you can like tie all those pieces together to solve mm -hmm. really complex computer vision problems, mm -hmm. like just putting this in your product effectively. Yeah. Hi, everybody, and welcome. This is Augment the Startups. We've got an interview with Brennan Gillers. Am I pronouncing it right? That's right. Yeah, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, so how's life in lockdown? Oh, man. Uh, so our company is largely remote anyways. So at least from like the work standpoint, uh, it's, it's going well, but yeah, it's, it's weird. It's definitely <laughs> weird. How about you? Yeah, uh, we're enjoying it here. Just working from home, you know, lockdown regulations are very strict to decide in South Africa. Where are you from? Uh, so we're north of Denver in Colorado in the U.S. Okay. That's cool. So for all of those who don't know, we have Brendan Gillis in our virtual studio, the CEO of Luxonus, and he has launched the OpenCV AI Kit, which is a tiny, powerful, and open source spatial AI system. And you, you've launched it on Kickstarter, right? Yep. So your original goal was $20,000 U.S. dollars, and Right now, currently, as we're speaking, it's reached over 700,000 US dollars. That, that That's is right. amazing. How does that feel? Yeah, it's, it's really gratifying. Um, you know, st working as a startup, like probably one of the biggest dangers is that you're making something that no one cares about. Uh, unless you're doing like, you know, nuclear fusion or something, like the chances are you'll pull off what you like seek to pull off. But there's a high risk that you make something that just no one wants. So this Kickstarter is really validating in that it said, okay, like people do actually want this. Like we are making, like we of course always thought it was super useful, but like the world does find it useful. Uh, and then we're super excited, most importantly, to get it in the hands of, of people who are gonna go build things with it. There's, this is like, it's such a new capability to have this like spatial AI in an embedded system. And we're really excited to see across so many industries what what people are gonna build. And so that's that's the thing we're most excited about, not the monetary, but how many backers there are. So I think it's like, you know, it looks like we're probably going to get 4,000 backers total, which is awesome. You know, that's potentially 4,000 different applications. And yeah. we've seen some really interesting ones, like <laughs> visual assistance for the blind probably being one, one of the coolest yeah. ones so it's far. It's really, it's really taken off. I mean, some people compare it to like the Raspberry Pi of its time. So how do you feel about that? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think it's a really good comparison. So the Raspberry Pi did for like, just allowing anyone to mm -hmm. do you know, programming on a small system that you could put anywhere. Uh, we're trying to accomplish the same thing for this like mm -hmm. embedded spatial AI. So allowing robotics to perceive the world and, and making it equally as easy to use and easy to go integrate uh, and also open source. So you can go build your own thing about it. You can take even the hardware design files uh, and go, go build around it, go build around the module. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we get started on all the main questions, we're just getting warmed up now. I just want to mention that all the links to the kit will be down below, uh, as well as the link to my YOLO version 4 course. And for those all watching, if you want to see more podcast interviews, please like and subscribe, right? Okay, so Brendan, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. What do you do? Yeah, what, yeah. what do I do? Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I'm the, the founder and CEO of Luxonis. I'm the chief architect of the OpenCV AI kit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my role in this whole thing. Uh, I worked closely with Dr. I worked closely with Dr. Malik to bring the OpenCV AI kit to the to the OpenCV community. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice! And how did you get started in the space? Uh, like after university, uh, what is your journey like up until this point? Yeah, that's a great question. So even in university, I had been very interested in a lot of different subjects in engineering, not just electrical engineering. I, I even didn't want to like sub-discipline in electrical engineering. And so then when you kind of had to, I, I tried to stay as broad as possible in EE. So I've done all sorts of things after college. Um, I did aerospace work. Mm -hmm. uh, I did like nitty gritty, like kind of researchy uh, radio frequency electronics. So including direction finding, geolocation systems, multilateration systems. Uh, and then moved into, I even did wireless charging at one point. Ooh. <laughs> um, G charging? And, yeah. Uh, so it was a precursor to that. It was called mm -hmm. Wild Charge. Um, yeah. And it was actually like a, 
it was wireless but contacted charging so it's like a clever geometry solution so you can mm. get like 99 percent efficiency out of it but yeah g is i think taken off and is now just like the de facto as far as i understand it so this mm. was a startup back in 2009 uh, that had oh. some traction for a bit um and then I moved into uh, like commercial wireless, so like business Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of my mentors leaving that job, we all really liked my job, definitely, or that job. That was uh, the most like satisfying and interesting like job I had ever had. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, when, I, when one of my mentors left, uh, it was a bit of a shock because everything was going well and like winning cures all. Uh, and so I interviewed him when he was leaving and he was like, well, this whole artificial intelligence boom is going to be mm -hmm. the biggest opportunity of my whole life. And this is this guy I look up to, extremely successful. And I knew nothing about AI at the time, like literally nothing. Like the only memory I had was from like 2004, probably with a yeah. college roommate talking to me about how useless it was, <laughs> like with Lisp. Um, yeah. So- It has uh, grown over the things, me. like uh, from, from that yeah. time. <laughs> oh you know yeah, mean? yeah, absolutely. So I started Googling like 2012, and then I found out like, oh, okay, well I was like, as of that conversation, that's 2016. So I was like, all right, well, I missed out on like four years, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Of like, this is like revolutionary techniques and AI that started really in 2012 with like, you know, NVIDIA GPUs and deep learning and in mm -hmm. all the like, you know, image net and being able to beat the best algorithms in the mm -hmm. world. So I was like, holy cow, I missed a huge wave. And I started to realize, okay, I've missed this big like cloud, big computing wave. But it looks like actually trying to apply this to like an embedded system is still impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe I could do something there. Uh, maybe yeah. I could like add some value by bringing this into embedded devices. And that was another one mm -hmm. of the, the roles that I had traditionally played is all around like embedded systems, like whether it was Wi-Fi or- yeah. or, It probably uh, wasn't uh, impossible. It was just like really, really, really hard <laughs> to do back yes. then. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And the, the chipsets were just starting to come out. And mm -hmm. so I was like watching those. Uh, and I actually left my job then to to start something around like embedded AI and computer vision. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was actually to do like kind of augmented reality uh, to make a kit that would allow like laser tag facilities, if you're familiar oh, with those, yes, to, yes. <laughs> to do like multiplayer augmented mm -hmm. reality by like using onboard computer vision to detect yeah. where you are, whether other players are. Um, and it was around those that time uh, that kind of tragedy struck like around me, not directly mm -hmm. close, but there were a bunch of uh, vehicle uh, accidents, so actually vehicle bicycle accidents where friends, family, colleagues uh, were mm -hmm. hit riding their bike bikes to and from work. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, already doing all this embedded uh, CD and AI stuff, and I was like, mm -hmm. well, could you actually make like an early warning device so like you mm -hmm. could tell when a car is on your trajectory, and yeah. then like proactively try to warn the biker and warn warn the car. And I yeah. discovered through prototyping a solution that actually worked that the combination of depth perception and AI was incredibly powerful mm -hmm. and really easy to use. Like my yeah. first prototype only took maybe two hours to write the code and it worked brilliantly. And that's using not because I'm a great API. programmer. Yeah, it was using an Intel, um, yeah. this was this was before we made Oak. So it was using okay. an Intel D435, yeah. a Raspberry Pi and a neural compute stick. Mm -hmm. It was really inefficient and used mm -hmm. tons of power. It was only three frames per second, Ooh. but it taught me how powerful that combination was. Yeah. And then when I went to try to productize something, I realized, oh, well, you, you can't actually build a product. You can build prototypes or if you have like a huge robot mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. that can have a whole computer, you can yeah. do that. Um, and then I discovered the Myriad X, which is at the basis of this, was which was really architected mm -hmm. to allow that sort of spatial AI system. Yeah. And that was kind of like what then Space led us down the path. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how big is your team currently? So we, it's it's kind of bifurcated into two. So uh, we have about 10 total that are working on like the core enabling firmware, hardware, software, mm -hmm. training suites that's like that's the platform itself. But then mm -hmm. that's in addition to you know this huge uh, open CV community, and then also the core open CV mm -hmm. team, uh, which like the core open CV teams, you know, quite large itself. So if you throw that in there, big. the numbers are really big. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the folks who are working directly on this, myself included, about 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. So let's get to the, the fun part, which is uh, about your open CV AI kit. Sometimes I get mixed up, I say open AI. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah. Open CV AI it kit. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, your Kickstarter is doing incredibly well, just like blown up, just phenomenal. What are they all about? Yeah, absolutely. So it 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 kind of dovetails from that backstory. So uh, traditional AI techniques, you know, are are monocular, um, and even techniques that use uh, stereo depth data in their training um, can be you know 
painful to work with because you have to record depth data, you have to have the exact mm -hmm. type of sensor. So the, the whole premise of this is it's, it allows embedded AI and it allows embedded spatial AI. So you mm -hmm. can, this is the board itself on a mount. Uh, and then you can take the, the module and like put it into a product, like actually embed this little thing into a product. Um, it's plug and play. And you can, yeah, it's plug and play. It's got this hundred pin connector that are really mm -hmm. common on these easy to solder. Um, and then you can interface over USB. Uh, we have variants um, that allow uh, UART. Actually, on this interface, there's UART, uh, I squared C, SPI, and some other interfaces. And mm -hmm. what this allows you is to harness like spatial AI. So what an mm -hmm. object is, where it is in a tiny mm -hmm. embedded thing, which is we discovered is is crazy powerful. And let's see what are uh, it, then the other the other part of that is you don't have to use models that are trained with depth data. And that's really important because there's this huge uh, wealth of libraries that exist and data sets that exist for 2D, like for YOLO, right? Uh, for mm -hmm. object detectors or image classifiers. So the kit allows you to run things in two ways. You can do what we call monocular neural inference fused mm -hmm. with stereo depth, which is yeah. like choose a camera, run AI on it, run YOLO, for example, mm -hmm. on it. And then the system will run stereo depth in the background. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get like a bounding box, like a face, right? Yeah. And the stereo depth. So the fusion between the, the fusion as well as the AI depth uh, that it's getting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then that gives you the 3D mm -hmm. position of the face. And that works great for objects mm -hmm. or relatively big things like any object detector, as long as it's not a tiny object. Yeah. And for tiny objects or things like getting 3D pose uh, information, mm -hmm. uh, you can run those, uh, what's called stereo neural inference. So if you have mm -hmm. a pose detector, say it's a 2D pose, or you have a facial landmark 2D, you can run those in parallel on both cameras mm -hmm. and then triangulate the results. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, I have glasses on and you see they're reflecting all over the place. Yeah. That would mess up typical stereo, but when you run neural inference mm -hmm. in parallel, uh, it doesn't get distracted. It still knows those are the eyes and it still triangulates it properly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> properly. Yeah. So those are the two modes that it allows. And importantly, yeah. you don't need any previous training on depth data or anything. You can just use standard neural models and then mm -hmm. this augments it and those, those two different ways to give you those mm -hmm. three-dimensional results. Ah, that's, that's amazing. So what pain points were you trying to solve? I know you mentioned earlier about people riding their bikes on the street and trying to avoid uh, accidents as well. Uh, what other yes. pain points? Was that the driving one or were there others? That's, that's what made us discover how useful that combination is, the combination mm -hmm. of depth fused with AI mm -hmm. um, in those two different modalities. But then the main pain point we were trying to solve is if you, this was a solvable problem if you're willing to, to throw multiple components on it, if, if you're okay for it to be like high power, relatively high volume, largely like you have to have like cables between things. But it was not a solvable problem if you just wanted to make like a device. And, and as we thought about how powerful this was, even just brainstorming industries where like, this has to be useful in agriculture. This has to be useful like in all sorts of other like autonomy systems where you can't solve the problem if you have some big cobbled together cable solution. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of yeah. times it has to be like a tiny thing. So that's the main so, thing. Sometimes uh, people use the Xbox Connect and Connect 2, but yeah. now you have this bulky device and then you have to connect it to a computer. You yeah. wanted to take that little bit of the concept and then make it into an embedded platform basically. Yeah, that's exactly right. So allow it to be small, mm -hmm. allow it to be modular. That was another pain point is even some of the devices were, were pretty awesome, but you know, they're just products, right? Like you can't like take and connect and like, you know, actually put it in your like mm -hmm. submarine or like put it on some small thing that goes on a bike or, or a million other applications. Yeah. Uh, so that was another... way, too, way too expensive as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's also the, um, the infrared. So like back in college, actually, so this all like, comes together. I did the spark fun autonomous vehicle competition. Mm -hmm. And like my first idea before I knew anything was to just use a connect. Cause I was like, look at how good it scans things. Like you <laughs> can do rules and like, and then I took it outside and it didn't work at all. Right. Yeah. So, uh, that's another like advantage of this passive solution is, you know, as long as like you can see, okay, this will perceive the world. Okay. Too. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can use it outside. You can use it at like relatively long range. Mm -hmm. You can use it real time. So yeah, I would say embedded the spatial portion, uh, real time and then passive. Uh, so it, it could potentially do nighttime. It's not super optimized for that. They are very low light cameras, high sensitivity cameras. So it's kind of application dependent on nighttime uh, scenarios. It is open source um, hardware as well. So you could actually use, these are not capable of seeing infrared, um, but you, there are alternate 
OV9282 modules that can be purchased and used with it. And we yeah. have tried out like two different variants that are IR capable. Mm -hmm. So in like dark nighttime applications where there's like a human can't see effectively, mm -hmm. um, that would probably need some like custom work. So you use like an totally infrared cool. illuminator or something like yeah. that, which is something we've played with. But some night scenes, like we have some test data we could share, mm -hmm. um, it can still see like decently well. So like yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, I, I get you. Like um, you start off at one point and then you move on to the next. So depending on the scenario, people can retrofit it for nighttime or if they need it for specifically daytime, they can uh, also have that. So yep. I see that your kit comes in two flavors. So Oak D and Oak One. It, it took me a while to figure out what Oak was until I realized it's Open CV AI kit. <laughs> so that's what it stands for. I know you've already mentioned what the difference is, but can you just briefly sum it up what the difference is between the two? Yeah, so you know the value part one of the value adds of these is like you can actually just embed them into products. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the main thing we were trying to solve is this this spatial AI. So I've got it on the mount here. So what an object is and where it is, or what a feature is, a pose in, in the 3D pose. Uh, but not all problems. There's actually quite a few like automatic sports filming. If you don't want statistics, you don't want to know physically where players are, but you want to know where the action is and film it and encode it, like do 12x lossless zoom onto it sort of thing. That's where uh, Oak One comes in. So it's mm -hmm. it's just that you can see there's a lot of parallels here. It's just the single camera brother. It's it's mm -hmm. kind of like you ripped off the wings here. Yeah. Um, so so that that's what that's for. If you don't need spatial data, but um, you need a high quality camera, so it's 12 megapixel. It has all these dedicated computer vision functions mm -hmm. of the Myriad X enabled in there. So you can do really interesting things like sports filming is, has been a popular response so far. Mm -hmm. So the idea there is you can do motion estimation or you can do object detection and mm -hmm. then use that to choose where you're going to crop and zoom. So it's mm -hmm. 12 megapixel camera. So you can zoom to 720p video mm -hmm. losslessly, pixel mm -hmm. losslessly. So like if, the, if you're watching football, and all the action is just in one corner of where this thing is mm -hmm. placed, it can zoom in 12x losslessly and just record that and output yeah. uh, 720p video, or it can zoom in 6x and output yeah. 1080p. So that's the use case for these. And then other use cases where you just, you don't need spatial data, but you'd you know, really like for the thing to be embedded in small. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you want like uh, real-time object detection or real-time pose yes. estimation for that. Yep. Okay. How did you determine the optimal disparity between the two cameras? Yeah, like the, the separation. So that's a great question. I think what you're asking is like, how do you, how do yeah. you choose? Like, what is the baseline here? Yeah. Uh, so we actually did it based on, we just Googled uh, human, human sight. Like, mm -hmm. what is the, the separation yeah, between our eyes? Yeah. And even like on this video, I can tell, I think mine are a bit narrower than yours. Like apparently <laughs> a narrow separation. Um, but like the widest of, like the widest of the range is 7.5 mm -hmm. centimeters. Um, and mm -hmm. we wanted to kind of parody Mm -hmm. human-like perception on an embedded device. So yeah. that's actually what influenced making this 7.5 centimeters. And so the, the larger you have it, the, um, the further you can perceive depth, isn't it? Yes, that's right. So this is fairly comparable to like a human perceive, like doing some specific task because it like detecting bad onions or, you know, mm -hmm. looking for an impending crash or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Uh, we do, since it's open source, and I actually have this on my desk, so there are variants, and this is on our GitHub. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can hold the thing up. So this is like this is an Oak D. Um, so it's it's all the same capabilities and everything, but then it's got modular mm -hmm. connectors. So we do yeah. have folks that are wanting to see like super far away, for example. And you can see this can do quite oh, a long I baseline. See. So it can do instead of uh, seven point five centimeters, yeah. it can do I think twenty five centimeters. So the um, Oak D is uh, basically connected by a ribbon cables internally to. Um, to the correct depth. Yeah, so on this model, there are actually little ribbon cables like mm -hmm. you're mentioning. Yeah. Um, and then the cameras are, are hard mounted. The, yeah. My camera is not amazing here, my iMac camera, but <laughs> you can see those two there. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the OD unit, but say if you wanted a different baseline, um, backers could you know, go ahead and, and get one of these and they could prototype mm -hmm. their own baseline. Yeah. Or since these are, it's open source hardware, they could actually just modify this as well. So they could yeah. change the baseline to 2.5 centimeters or five or, or whatever they'd like yeah. all on one board. I see the, um, the power consumption for the Oak D is uh, four, four watts. Yes. And then the, um, the Oak one is 2.5 watts from what I see from your FAQs. Yes. Okay. It's quite low powered. Yeah. Yeah, so compared to what I used to use back in the days when I was doing my master's in engineering, 
Uh, we were looking at the Bumblebee. I don't know if you've seen that device. I so, have. I'm not remembering the specs on it, but I'm going to Google it real quick. It's a very, I think it's called the Bumblebee 3. I'm looking at Okay, it's taking me to the movie. <laughs> yeah, my, it, got, it got taken by Transformers, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then there's a Transformers 3, which totally is messing it up. Too, <laughs> it? Uh, we'll, we'll find it uh, later on. But uh, back in the days, that was a really expensive uh, camera to use. Uh, and your, your price is just like way below that. So it's more affordable for like the student, for the hobbyist. It's more tractable too for like mm -hmm. installing into a device. So being under five watts is kind of yeah. like that inflection point that if you're under five watts, figuring out a cooling mechanism isn't too hard. If you're above five watts, generally mm -hmm. it, it gets tricky or you need a fan. Mm. Or oh, heating. Yeah. Yeah. So regarding the hardware of the OpenCV uh, AI kit, what's powering these units? Yeah. So this is the Movidius Myriad X. Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's a really interesting chip. And it was part of the reason we went, well, like the main reason we went down this path is we were trying to solve that like life safety application and we could prototype it with off the shelf components. So this is the Myriad X directly on their tiny little chip. We'll find it in the neural compute stick. Yeah, it's the same as in the neural compute stick. Mm -hmm. So here's our OpenCV AI kit, the modular board, here's the neural compute stick. And uh, it, the chip's super interesting. So there's a bunch of geniuses effectively who kind of foresaw this spatial AI thing coming together. And so they architected this chip that's, it's a network on chip. Um, so it's got all these modules. It's got two neural compute engines and that's all that's really used in this. It's got 16 shaves, which are also used to assist uh, neural inference, but mm -hmm. all you can do on this is neural inference. And then it's got uh, stereo depth hardware. So it's actually mm -hmm. hardware modules in there. It's like three of the D4 processors in the Intel D435 or 455. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a bunch of hardware acceleration for like warp, de-warp, motion estimation. It's all these like individual processors for dedicated common computer vision tasks. And then they're linked together on what's called a network on chip where you can prioritize their connections. So you can do these really interesting use cases. And that's what our pipeline builder exposes. And that was the original intention of the chip. Um, that you can say do motion estimation and then feed the results of the motion estimation region into an encoder. Uh, or you can feed that motion estimation into an object detector like YOLO. And then that is what can do your automatic sports filming or knowing what's a good onion and a bad onion. And that's all, so the OpenCV AI kit, the whole premise is it, it makes that easy to use and accessible. Whereas this, you can only do neural inference. When you use this thing in the OpenCV AI kit, you get all those, that cr the crazy powerful functionality and uh, kind of drag and drop flexibility mm -hmm. is what we've implemented. So you can like tie all those pieces together to solve mm -hmm. really complex computer vision problems, mm -hmm. just putting this in your product effectively. Yeah. Basically um, you've uh, unlocked the power of the, um, the new compute stick and you just gave it wings or in this case eyes and yep. be able to do a lot of wonderful things with it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's unlocking the power of the Myriad X, like the mm -hmm. original vision. I don't know who originally architected, but mm -hmm. I would hope that, you know, they see this and they're like, yes, like someone did it. Right? <laughs> Finally, someone... This is what the chip is for. Yeah. <laughs> someone put it to good use. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How do these devices or these kits uh, compare to something like the Jetson boards, like the Jetson Nano, the Google Coral? Why would people yeah. buy your kits over the already available alternatives? Uh, and what sets your boards apart? Yeah, so one of the things is all like probably the the main thing is like completely integrated like spatial AI. So with like a, a Google Coral or um, NVIDIA, like Jetson Nano, the Jetson series is fantastic. Coral is fantastic. Um, they do a great job of kind of like modular, especially the, the Jetson Nano, like modular, flexible neural inference. But if you want spatial data, then you have to go ahead and like buy a depth camera, right? So mm -hmm. if you're trying to build a product, you have to buy a depth camera, you have to buy a Jetson Nano, you have to integrate them together and write your own stack. So the big differentiator here is say the Jetson Nano, this is also faster, um, but that's not like the main reason to buy it. The main reason is uh, you get all of that integrated together and it just mm -hmm. works. You don't have to write yeah. all your own integration. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have USB cables going between the various things. Mm -hmm. You can even, you know, buy the module, uh, hook it to some microcontroller or not even have a microcontroller, just run MicroPython on it mm -hmm. uh, to like command and control your robot. Um, okay. and so that's the main one is the, the spatial portion. It's all mm -hmm. integrated spatial. It's, it's like you took a, a Jetson Nano, 
mm -hmm. like an Intel D four forty five four fifty five and like had a baby, right? Uh, and it's just like one thing. Yeah. Um, so so then the second advantage is like this is actually just a straight up embedded system. So mm -hmm. whereas you know Google Coral and uh, Jetson Nano are running full versions of Linux, which mm -hmm. can be great in its flexibility. If you're trying to do a really low power embedded situation, say you put this on like an e-bike or an e-scooter, mm -hmm. like you want it to be off most of the time, but you want it to turn on immediately when the mm -hmm. person like hops on the bike and runs. Yeah. So this has like 200 millisecond boot time, right? Wow. Because it's just okay. pure embedded. Yeah. Whereas with Linux, like, I mean, if you're like a super genius, you're crazy good with Linux, maybe yeah. you can like pull that off, but it's a ton, <laughs> a ton of work, if right? It's a lot so, of work, so, <laughs> Yeah. So the other aspect, say, even when you don't have the spatial is, mm -hmm. is you can embed it into something and you can do these the crazy low power modes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of specs, so the um, like neural inference, this is a bit faster than the Jetson Nano. It's, it's not quite as flexible. It's that trade, right? Like Jetson yeah. Nano is just a GPU. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do have to compile models and stuff for this, but it's yeah. about 4 trillion operations per second total computer vision like horsepower. And the Jetson mm -hmm. Nano is 0.47. Um, so when you when you're using all of those features, all the computer vision and the neural mm -hmm. inference, it's yeah. it can do quite a lot more. Um, and then in terms of straight up neural inference, it's about maybe like one to two, depending on what you're doing. So whereas the it's like 0.5 for Jetson Nano, this is like around one to two. So it it'll generally be faster. Yeah, I'd like to see a, a comparison between your board versus other boards in terms of like object detection, pose estimation, and a wide variety. Maybe in the future, we could see something like that, like a side-by-side -side comparison. That would be great. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we've only done like very initial ones right now. So like a TRT optimized Jetson Nano gets like maybe 20 to 30, if I remember correctly, frames mm -hmm. per second. Correct me if I'm wrong. Running like MobileNet SSD. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're seeing about like 40 to 50 on these boards. So you have mm -hmm. to do an option that increases the frame rate on the cameras to yeah. enable that because they're by default 30. Um, so that's about where we land. Oh, mm -hmm. and I didn't cover the Google Coral. So the Google Coral is four mm -hmm. tops of neural inference, whereas this is like one to two-ish, and then mm -hmm. it's four tops for everything. So when you're doing mm -hmm. all the computer vision functions too. So straight up neural inference, the Coral will be faster, Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have all those other computational capabilities. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Now with great hardware comes great firmware and software, right? What is the API like? Yeah, so uh, first it's MIT licensed. And, the, mm -hmm. and same with all the hardware. So uh, you can take it and you know not talk to us and go integrate it into a commercial product. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal of the API is just to make it uh, super flexible and easy and discoverable. So the discoverable portion is probably the most important. That like I kind of made up that word for this application, but but what we do is like you plug it in, you literally like run like one command, and it's just like a test example command, and you see the spatial AI, right? And like yeah. everything's working. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, interesting. And could I use this model? And then like, you just try that model instead and it works. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like an Apple, like it works and you don't know why, but mm -hmm. then to make, uh, like make that discovery really easy. So you're like, okay, well, it works. I'm super excited. It so mostly solves my problem. How do I go mm -hmm. to the next stage? Mm -hmm. Then as you start to dig in, you're like, oh, holy cow, there's a whole bunch of options here mm -hmm. that I can use and I can exploit and customize, but they don't like smack you in the face initially. They don't get in your way to get the thing working. It's all about like, it just works. And if it already solves your problem, you don't have to dig mm -hmm. further. Uh, but then it, if you want to customize, there's there's a whole wealth of options, like video encoding options, like customizable pipelines. So you can string all these mm -hmm. uh, functionalities together. And you can do that with simple kind of like simple commands to build the pipeline, or mm -hmm. you can do graphical, or you can have something directly export JSON. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it provides a ton of flexibility mm -hmm. uh, when you want it, but yeah. but you don't have to, that doesn't get in your way. So it's uh, basically normally when you get a new piece of hardware, you like take it, you know, you have to try and figure it out. You have to know some uh, background programming language or like a lot of experience behind the stuff that you need to implement. So uh, you probably answered this before, but how is it for a student or someone just getting started like a graduate or even a hobbyist to get started with your kit? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, thanks for bringing that up. So, we're making the, the like the whole API flow and then the initial user experience with the API, mm -hmm. uh, so that an artist who wants, who's maybe it's an artist who's made a sculpture with like servos in it, but like isn't isn't a programmer, doesn't come from a technical background, but just mm -hmm. like wants to make an interactive sculpture, mm -hmm. uh, make it so they would be able to uh, use this 
like with just like one change of line of code, just like mm -hmm. looking at a tutorial, put a pose estimator in there. And then you have like a sculpture that's like following your pose, right? Mm -hmm. So the goal is to make it trivially easy. And then diving down into the specifics of that, we use pip install. So it's mm -hmm. just gonna have straight up pip install support. Mm -hmm. So you like get the unit and you just say pip install the library. And then for, you know, you're running Mac OS 10, you're running Ubuntu or Raspbian mm -hmm. or any common operating system will have pre-built everything. So it's mm -hmm. open source, but pre-built binaries that bind to Python. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also C++. But if you're running some other form, it's open source. So like Windows, for example, mm -hmm. that will also be pre-built. So let's pretend yeah. it's not. Uh, okay. Then it'll, when you do pip install, it'll actually just build it from source. Yeah. Installing the tools that you need, build it from source mm -hmm. for that, and then just run. Yeah. So this won't only work with Raspberry Pi, it'll work with all operating systems. So if I just do develop on my PC and then transport it to the Raspberry Pi, I can do that. Yep. Okay. That's, that's exactly that's really right. Awesome. And the idea, the idea is like mm -hmm. when you're prototyping something, you just want to plug it into your computer and see what it does, right? Yeah, exactly. So we need that user experience yeah. to be awesome because if it's a huge pain, like, you know, it's a super busy world, mm -hmm. people have a lot of options, a lot of things to do. You just walk away and you do something else, right? Like yeah, exactly. it's hard to get running. <laughs> And then the, the transition there is it works on your computer. You can go use it on a Pi. It's, mm -hmm. it's really, uh, we actually have a video showing the setup on a Pi. It's like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the next transition is we have like an SPI. Um, so serial peripheral interface for just straight up microcontrollers. So you can start on your computer, you can go to a Raspberry Pi, and then you want to install it in something that doesn't even have an operating system. You, we have an open source SPI interface and a variant of the module that just, just boots by itself. Um, so then you can, build it into your little robot or, you know, put it into some mm. uh, cost sensitive product where you don't want to have a whole Linux operating system. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, that's really amazing. I mean, why should building something be hard? <laughs> I know yeah. it, uh, you learn a lot from debugging, but you also learn a lot by building and progressing in your work as well. So moving on to the program interface, I saw that there's a drag and drop visual program interface called pipeline builder. Can you tell yes. us a bit about that? Yeah. So the, the quick background there is we envisioned use cases based on like our initial customers who've been using these systems and the feedback they need, like being able to run neural models in parallel, like our eyes do, or being able to do disparity depth and being able to do encoding. And so we have this in that like rendition, we call that pipeline builder gen one. Uh, there's kind of like this very fixed number of permutations and flexibility. You can do like so many series neural networks. You can do so many parallel, you can like, it's somewhat rigid. So the mm -hmm. pipeline builder Gen 2, which is what's uh, covered on the Kickstarter, is we saw there were some pretty complex flows of computer vision functions that specific customers would want to build and then have run performant mm -hmm. on the Myriadex. And it had enough resources to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of set out with the pipe dream of like, wouldn't it be awesome to just have a drag and drop interface, right? Like mm -hmm. I'd like motion estimation off of the color camera, boom, yeah. right? And then I would like to run a neural inference, like an object detector, YOLO, only mm -hmm. on the, the pixels that have motion, right? Say yeah. if it's a fixed camera, like watching a soccer game or something. Yeah. Um, and then that lets your object detector see further, right? Because mm -hmm. instead of decimating from 12 megapixels down to, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, YOLO is I think 416 by 416, right? So you're losing yeah. a ton of information. If there happens to only be motion in the corner of the field, right? Mm -hmm. It's only like 300 by 300, then the full 416 by 416. Mm -hmm. And that takes your YOLO object detection distance from like, let's say it's like 80 or 90 feet or something to like mm -hmm. hundreds of feet. Uh, and that's just one example. So we wanted to make these hardware or expose these hardware blocks and then our firmware that's running on there mm -hmm. in this drag and drop way, which is a ton more work because you have to make all the inputs and outputs compatible and, mm -hmm. and manage resources and, and keep it uh, high performance. But then it allows folks to take this and implement their entire computer vision flows mm -hmm. using yeah. these blocks. And so, so, the if I want builder, to, so if I want yeah. to take something like I want to do gender classification or if I want to do number plate recognition, I can stack different thing flows on top of yes. each other. And then yep. in the pipeline, that would give me my output from that. That's right. Yeah, and so that's, that's, that's such a perfect example. And actually, when we were architecting the pipeline builder, we took the number plate recognition. So it's like vehicle detection, vehicle like make model detection, mm -hmm then bound or then uh, license plate detection mm -hmm. and then OCR mm -hmm. and like strung those all together. And then yeah. we did a whole bunch of similar ones like that, where it's like, you know, person detection, like what is it like age and like emotion detection mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. And, and then also like re-identification, string those together mm -hmm. so that folks could then build those apps and then any other flows that they mm -hmm. want. Uh, and it comes down to like three modalities in the pipeline yeah. builder. So there's like, uh, there's like maybe 12 or something very, very fast accelerated 
mm -hmm. functions like neural inference is one of them, disparity depth, all those sorts of things. And you can drag and drop those however you want, but mm -hmm. say on your like, um, like age and emotion recognition, for example, mm -hmm. in that case, maybe if a bounding box is too small or too big based on person recognition, you don't want to do the age because you know it's going to be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like in some little corner, you know, it's probably on a post or on a wall or something. So we also support another modality is running micro Python as a node. Mm -hmm. So you can still have this performant flow with no host at all. And then MicroPython can do rules like throwing away bounding boxes that you've decided are in the wrong location or the wrong size. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also OpenCL support. So if of these first computer vision functions, like if you don't see the one you need, you know, we have this, mm -hmm. this list of ones that are hardware accelerated and you, maybe you have your own proprietary computer vision, you can use OpenCL to transfer it and then run that as a node accelerated by the 16 shave processors on there. Uh, and you can drag and drop all those together, just like yeah. you were talking about. Wow, that's amazing. Thanks. Okay, so how do you see these kits being used to combat real world issues like COVID-19? You know, yeah. the, the world is plagued, you need to get over this. Yeah, so in a variety of ways, probably the one that's like, is probably the, the most important and most interesting, um, in, in, I, maybe not most interesting, but the one that I just didn't think about. And so it was like fascinating to me when it was brought up as a result of our Kickstarter is visually impaired people right now are, are suffering depression at levels like they have never been seen before in the history of the world because you go out if you have a visual impairment and you end up being too close to someone and you don't realize it and so you get yelled at or you have things thrown at you because you just can't tell you're close to them and then worse a lot of them after they have this experience a lot of these people after they have this horrifying experience because you're too close someone gets mad at you you could be contracting COVID-19 and you're unaware of it um, just stay home and so suffer like lack of mobility, a lack of capability to do things because they're afraid of, you know, getting ostracized mm -hmm. or, or catching COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, so one of the, the coolest things we've seen, like heartwarming things we've seen with the technology is there are OpenCV spatial AI competitions sponsored by Intel. I think there was like 55 or 60 entrants on doing blind assistance devices. So it uses mm -hmm. this spatial AI to know things like where are people, where are people with and without masks, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, and then that lends itself to a more so that's helping visually impaired navigate and have mobility and be safe in mm -hmm. this you know, weird pandemic era. But it lends itself to other applications like social distancing, monitoring, contact tracing, like in a warehouse, for example, like reminding people to, to stay separated. You could detect, did people have masks on when they passed each other, right? And you can log that. Uh, and if you wanted, you know, a company could then use that to like backtrace like, oh, that we had an employee mm -hmm. and here are the people that he interacted with when they were in contact with those people right? and then we need to isolate those people. Yeah, exactly. And then there's other applications like robotics, robotic mm -hmm. cleaning, um, mm -hmm. having like UV cleaning robots that can wander around and just sanitize the air uh, to get like the aerosols, the, the viral aerosols out of the air. Like robot nurses um, as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. So there's a, and then, and then the whole like delivery boom too, right? Like mm -hmm. this is, this spatial AI allows like navigation to a lot, be a lot easier to actually mm -hmm. do delivery robotics and so forth. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's, a, I think yeah. a ton of good that this can do for enabling, you know, lower cost, yeah. more real time solutions so, like so that. Are you able to do slam on this device? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so, so traditionally, like if you take a stereo camera, right, it's like, what do you use it for? A lot of times the answer was mapping, right? Like making a map of someone's head or making a map of a product or making a map of a room. Um, and then for navigation purposes. Um, so yes, it, it has a lot of the things built in that would help with SLAM, right? It can produce depth outputs. It can produce like feature tracking, which is both key point detection and optical flow, very useful in SLAM. But we're not, we're not architected to be a SLAM camera. So okay. if you if you took like a, a camera and they're very good slam cameras out there, if you took one of those and used it instead, you'd probably get better slam results. Now, mm -hmm. there are some interesting use cases of slam when you have AI on board. Mm -hmm. So like take a Roomba cleaning a house, for example, those use slam and they get confused and a lot of robots get confused and you move your couch and your furniture around and it's just, mm -hmm. oh, what the hell is happening? Because it doesn't <laughs> well, know that's yeah. couch or furniture. And so the map gets totally messed up and it, it mm -hmm. loses its navigation reference points. So if you can run AI on device, which this can, then you can know as you're passing something that's a chair or a coffee table that's gonna move often to not throw off your map, right? Just like ignore that whole section as it's going by or when like a person's walking by, you know it's a person. So yes, it, it can be used mm -hmm. um, in that our advice would be, you know, use it if you only are planning on like leveraging the AI aspects of it. If you're just yeah. wanting to use it as a algorithmic based slam, mm -hmm. you know, use one of the amazing slam cameras that already yeah. exist. Okay, cool.
So how do people watching this video get their hands on your kits and when can they expect the delivery? Where will it be available? Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, our Kickstarter is kind of like our bulk order to like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we're using Kickstarter in the premise of Kickstarter, which is like, you know, it, it pretends like every person is like someone ordering 10,000 of them or mm -hmm. like 100,000 in terms of the mm -hmm. pricing. So get the price as low as possible, do one big bulk order together so then everyone can get the best possible pricing. But the trade on that is time. So mm -hmm. the Kickstarter, like even our suppliers, they have to order the supplies to build their camera modules at these mm -hmm. volumes. And so, and most of those are like maybe 10 weeks to get those back, 12 weeks, something like that. So mm -hmm. uh, the Kickstarter delivers in December at, as, you know, and we don't hide that. We put that right when you check out, it says it delivers in December, yeah. but there are units available now. They're just more expensive because all the components are like two or three times the price when you mm -hmm. own, when you purchase them at low volume. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of where can it be delivered, pretty much anywhere. So there's the US embargo list, so we mm -hmm. can't deliver there. Um, but this gets classified the same as, as one of these guys, yeah. the neural compute stick. Like, would you be able so to get it like at your RS components or your Mauser or DigiKey, uh, those sorts of places? Yes. Yeah, so it, it will be on Mauser theoretically soon. <laughs> some mm -hmm. like, some yeah. like glitch in the background, but you'll be able to buy it on Mauser. Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked to RS components or, or DigiKey or those folks yet. So mm -hmm. it's, it's primarily Mauser at this point, but Likely, very likely, I'd say, because, uh, and I can't speak for each one, but the idea behind the Kickstarter was to really get it out to the world. And yes, so then, yes. you know, folks are like, oh, this is a thing, and then mm -hmm. we can carry it to various distributors. That, that is the plan, yes. Oh, yes, of course. Okay, so uh, I see you're also planning to release a nice crash course there. Obviously, because you guys made it so easy and simple, would there even be a need for a course? <laughs> but um... yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, it's a really good question, right? It's one yeah. of those things that's like, the, and the answer is there's always a need for a course because mm -hmm. what this does is like, you know, previously and machine learning is getting so much better in this regard, right? Like, you when know, I was playing with networks in like 2017, it was like, cool, I spent like three weeks trying to get my GPU to working with this library, right? Yeah. And like, then you get like an object detector running and it's like a huge victory. Mm -hmm. um, and so then like back then, the course was just like, how do you do get object detector detection running? But now mm -hmm. the courses can move on to like more complex implementations. Like how do you do this type of scenario mm -hmm. efficiently on the hardware and like mm -hmm. how do you leverage it and here's like here's some really interesting things that you could do that you might not know immediately and here's the exactly. example flows so it's it just moves the the problem space that you're covering another from like, place yeah yeah to this more complicated yeah. solving solving like a mm -hmm. systems level problem instead of just how do you get a, like a basic component to exactly. run so just like our course um we were trying to teach uh, yolo v4 uh, how to get it up and running uh, even though yeah. You do have like GitHub repositories showing you how to implement it from A to Z. But yes. we were thinking, how do we take Yolo V4 and implement it to actual products uh, or actual projects? So we yep. implemented a mass detection uh, like you had, social distancing monitoring as well. The other one is also using a cough sneeze data set. We're trying to detect if someone is coughing or sneezing. So oh, cool. yeah. we, we're trying to have all these different applications to make it a bit more fun and more exciting rather than just, okay, yeah. how do I implement it? Yes, that's it, done and dusted. So we, we, we did speak earlier about collaboration course. So people who do buy the kit uh, can also learn how to use it and watching the training and tutorials and course, which will be first on Augmented Startup's uh, YouTube channel and also on our website. <laughs> and lastly, if people have any questions, how do they contact you? Yeah, so there's a variety of ways uh, on our Kickstarter. They, they can feel free to post, uh, like if they're backers, we have a discussion forum, so it's mm -hmm. uh, discuss.luxonis.com. Uh, we also have, if, if you go to luxonis.com or docs.luxonis.com, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, information there on how to use, like what exists now and how to use it. And at the bottom, you can join a Slack channel. So we have a, a community Slack channel and there's a lot of really interesting discussion and use cases there. And then folks can just uh, email me. I'm brandon at, brandon at opencv.org or brandon uh, at luxonis.com. Uh, so email us directly. Yeah. And then also on GitHub. So we have, you know, everything's open source, all the, you know, all the hardware that's built around, you know, this, this module. And then, you know, of course, all the host code and, and training and everything we have those example networks. So in each respective one, if you have an idea like, Hey, I would love to see this version of training, or I'd love to see you know, this example or this new board feature, uh, folks can make a GitHub issue and, and tag one of us. Yeah. Uh, so any and all of those, probably the fastest is Slack, I would say. Yeah, a lot of people are using Slack these days. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that's all the questions we have. Thank you, Brendan, uh, for joining us. It was a real yeah. honor. And 
I really look forward to playing around with one of these kits when, when I get my hands on them. I'm sure a lot of people on our channel are also quite excited. Also, for those who are looking to learn uh, AI and computer vision, I have courses in YOLO version 4, Object Detection, Open Pose, Mass RCNN, as well as my course on Augmented Reality. And you can check them all down and also get Brandon's kits on Kickstarter down below. Thank you, Brandon. And yeah, thanks we'll, for your time. See you soon. I really appreciate it. Yeah, talk soon. Cheers.